Chapter 7 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chase Landcammer. You can visit my Facebook page at Chase Landcammer Voice Artist. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 7 Flying Machines other forms. While the efforts of inventors have been principally along the lines of the successful monoplanes and biplanes, genius and energy have also been active in other directions. Some of these other designs are not much more than variations from prevailing types, however. Among these is the English row triplane, which is but a biplane with an extra plane added, the depths of all being reduced to give approximately the same surface as the biplane of the same carrying power. The tail is also of the triplane type, and has a combined area of 160 square feet, just half that of the main planes. The triplane type has long been familiar to Americans in the three-decker glider used extensively by Octave Chanute in his long series of experiments at Chicago. The quadruplane of Colonel Baden-Powell, also an English type, is practically the biplane with unusually large forward and tail planes. The multiplane of Sir Hiram Maxim should also be remembered. Although he never permitted it to have free flight, his new multiplane modeled after the former one, but equipped with an improved gasoline motor instead of the heavy steam engine of the first model, will doubtless be put to a practical test when experiments with it are completed. Quite apart from these variants of the aeroplanes are the helicopters, ornithopters, gyropters, gyroplanes, and tetrahedral machines. Helicopters The result aimed at in the helicopter is the ability to rise vertically from the starting point, instead of first running along the ground for from 100 to 300 feet before sufficient speed to rise is attained, as the airplanes do. The device employed to accomplish this result is a propeller, or propellers, revolving horizontally above the machine. After the desired altitude is gained, it is proposed to travel in any direction, by changing the plane in which the propellers revolve to one having a small angle with the horizon. The force necessary to keep the airplane moving in its horizontal path is the same as that required to move the automobile of equal weight up the same gradient, much less than its total weight. The great difficulty encountered with this type of machine is that the propellers must lift the entire weight. In the case of the airplane, the power of the engine is used to slide the plane up an incline of air and for this much less power is required. For instance, the weight of a Curtis biplane with the pilot on board is about 700 pounds, and this weight is easily slid up an inclined plane of air with a propeller thrust of about 240 pounds. Another difficulty is that the helicopter screws, in running at the start before they can attain speed sufficient to lift their load, have established downward currents of air with great velocity, in which the screws must run with much less efficiency. With the airplanes, on the contrary, their running gear enables them to run forward on the ground almost with the first revolution of the propeller, and as they increase their speed, the currents, technically called the slip, become less and less as the engine speed increases. In the Cornu helicopter, which perhaps has come nearer to successful flight than any other, these downward currents are checked by interposing planes below, set at an angle determined by the operator. The glancing of the currents of air from the planes is expected to drive the helicopter horizontally through the air. At the same time, these planes offer a large degree of resistance, and the engine power must be still further increased to overcome this, while preserving the lift of the entire weight. With an eight-cylinder Antoinette motor, said to be but 24 horsepower, turning two 20-foot propellers, the machine is reported as lifting itself and two persons a total weight of 723 pounds to a height of 5 feet, and sustaining itself for one minute. Upon the interposing of the planes to produce the horizontal motion, the machine came immediately to the ground. This performance must necessarily be compared with that of the aeroplanes, as, for instance, the Wright machine, which, with a 25 to 30 horsepower motor operating two 8-foot propellers, raises a weight of 1,050 pounds and propels it at a speed of 40 miles an hour for upward of two hours. Another form of helicopter is the Ledger machine, so named after its French inventor, 
It has two propellers which revolve on the same vertical axis, the shaft of one being tubular, encasing that of the other. By suitable gearing, this vertical shaft may be inclined after the machine is in the air in the direction in which it is desired to travel. The gyropter differs from the cornu type of helicopter in degree rather than in kind. In the Scotch machine, known as the Davidson gyropter, the propellers have the form of immense umbrellas made up of curving slats. The frame of the structure has the shape of a T, one of the gyropters being attached to each of the arms of the T. The axis upon which the gyropters revolve may be inclined so that their power may be exerted to draw the apparatus along in a horizontal direction after it has been raised to the desired altitude. The gyropters of the Davidson machine are 28 feet in diameter, the entire structure being 67 feet long and weighing 3 tons. It has been calculated that with the proposed pair of 50 horsepower engines, the gyropters will lift 5 tons. Upon a trial with a 10 horsepower motor connected to one of the gyropters, the end of the apparatus was lifted from the ground at 55 revolutions per minute, the boiler pressure being 800 pounds to the square inch, at which pressure it burst, wrecking the machine. An example of the gyroplane is the French Breguet apparatus, a blend of the aeroplane and the helicopter. It combines the fixed winged planes of the one with the revolving vanes of the other. The revolving surfaces have an area of 82 square feet, and the fixed surfaces 376 square feet. The total weight of the machine and the operator is about 1,350 pounds. Fitted with a 40 horsepower motor, it rose freely into the air. The ornithopter, or flapping wing type of flying machine, though the object of experiment and research for years, must still be regarded as unsuccessful. The apparatus of M. de la Halte may be taken as typical of the best effort in that line, and it is yet in the experimental stage. The throbbing beat of the mechanism, in imitation of the bird's wings, has always proved disastrous to the structure before sufficient power was developed to lift the apparatus. The most prominent exponent of the tetrahedral type, that made up of numbers of small cells set one upon another, is the signet of Dr. Alexander Graham Bell which perhaps is more a kite than a true flying machine. The first Signet had 3,000 cells and lifted its pilot to a height of 176 feet. The Signet II has 5,000 tetrahedral cells and is propelled by a 50-horsepower motor. It is yet to make its record. One of the most recently devised machines is that known as the Fritz Russ Flyer. It has two wings, each in the form of half a cylinder, the convex curve upward, it is driven by two immense helical screws, or spirals, set within the semi-cylinders. No details of its performances are obtainable. End of chapter 7. Flying Machines. Other Forms. Recording by Chase Landcammer.